round of launches in three weeks. South Korea says it will tighten safety inspections on more waste imports from Japan amid increased public concern over radioactive contamination. This follows a similar measure last week, targeting imports of coal ash from Japan. A petition in Japan garners thousands of signatures calling for a major art festival in Nagoya to bring back a statue symbolizing victims of Japan's sexual slavery. Artists also demand for their work at the Aichi Triennale to be taken down in protest of the statue's removal. And the finance ministry for a fifth straight month says South Korea's economy is, quote, stagnant. The latest Green Book shows exports and growth are still weak and Japan's trade curves are not helping. News Center begins now. Good evening and welcome to Arirang News Centre. Coming to you live from Seoul, I'm Noah Adam. And I'm Han Dan. Thanks for joining us. We we'll begin with yet another test firing of projectiles by North Korea. The regime launched what are believed to be two ballistic missiles into the East Sea earlier today. This marks the sixth round of launches in just three weeks and came shortly after Pyongyang again lashed out its Seoul over its joint military drills with the US. Kim ji starts us off. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said North Korea fired what it presumes to be two short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea at around 8.01 and 8.16 Friday morning. They were fired from North Korea's eastern coastal county of Tongcheon in the north Gangwon-do province, recording a maximum altitude of some 30 kilometers with a flight distance of some 230 kilometers and maximum speed of more than Mach 6.1, which is some 7,466 kilometers per hour. The South Korean military is monitoring the situation while maintaining a readiness posture and is working closely with the U.S. to verify more details about Friday's firing. The latest launch is seen as a response to the joint summertime training by the U.S. and South Korean militaries, but a military source said that the recent launches may have been planned long ago and that the North is using the drill as an excuse to continue their launches. A military source confirmed that Friday's test fire is being deemed a successful launch as the missiles hit an uninhibited island called Aesam, or rocket target in Korean, which is near the missile base of Kiteryong that stores short-range Scud missiles and medium-range Nodong that could be used in real combat. Back in August 2017, North Korea had test-fired three short-range projectiles in the vicinity of Kiteryong near Tongcheon County during the South Korea-U.S. joint military exercise, the Uchi Freedom Guardian. The latest provocation comes amid North Korea's continued criticism over the South Korea-U.S. Joint Combined Command Post training, despite it being scaled down from previous versions. The training will continue until next Tuesday, August 20th, and involves computer-based war simulations to verify South Korea's state of readiness for the envisioned transfer of wartime operation and control from Washington to Seoul. This year, real military equipment and troops have not been mobilized. Kim ji Arirang News. Immediately following the missile launches, South Korea's National Security Council urged North Korea to stop such actions, which it says only raise military tensions. The members of the committee agreed to closely consult with the U.S. in analyzing the latest missiles. The NSC met this morning, led by the head of the National Security Office, Chung Uyung. According to the Blue House, President Moon Jae-in has been briefed on the launch and related developments. Today's missile launches come following a series of North Korea's previous launches in recent weeks. Most of them, according to the South Korean military, were short-range ballistic missiles. While analysis by the government is still ongoing, the Defense Ministry says today's missiles are also presumed to be short-range ballistic missiles. To get some more clues, let's now bring in Dr. Woo jong yeop of Sejong Institute. Thanks for joining us. Hello. 
So today's missiles flew some 230 kilometers, recording a maximum altitude of some 30 kilometers. North Korea has been firing a new type of short range ballistic missile recently, and today was no exception. Why is North Korea sticking to short range ballistic missiles? Uh, the, the, the foremost reason might be that they don't want to violate the sanctions levied by the United Nations and the international community. If they go over the certain range, which is obviously over the range of the mid-range or long range, then it's going to uh, invoke that aut automatic uh, sanctions by 2039 uh, which is... The whole U.S. sanctions probably North Korea from testing any ballistic missiles. But if it goes over the long-range missiles, there's like automatic uh, close that will uh, levy another sanction on North Korea. So I think that, that is why North Korea just stick to short-range missiles. And uh, North Korea has observed that the U.S. government and especially President Trump uh, has not raised their eyebrows for the short-range missiles so far. So that is why North Korea is sticking to the short range missiles. So it doesn't want to go as far to violate UN resolutions and provoke uh, the U.S. Now, today's missiles were fired off Tongcheon County, North Korea's eastern coastal county that's located only 50 kilometers north of the de uh, military demarcation line. What do you read from the quite rare launch location? So uh, there has been uh, some missile launches in the past from the similar locations. But today's uh, launch can show that North Korea's missile range covers that the Pyongyang Humphrey, uh, the U.S. base, and the Osan U.S. Uh, Air Force uh, base. That means that by, by showing these kind of capabilities uh, to reach the certain uh, important military bases, uh, within Korea, that they can they can uh, enhance their leverages for for force coming uh, negotiation with the United States, and at the same time that they can raise the stakes on the negotiations with the United States, so they can have more access to sell. Now, this is North Korea's sixth missile launch in three weeks and the eighth this year alone. Do you expect Pyongyang to halt its provocative acts once the joint South Korea-U.S. drills are over? So we don't know yet whether North Korea is going to stop all those provocations once the joint military drill is over. Actually, the nature of the military drill this time is not uh, not incorporating any any soldiers or military bases. It's computer-based simulation, which is about uh, whether South Korea is ready to transfer the open transfer uh, open control op operational control in wartime. So North Korea knows the nature of the military drills this time. So it's very difficult to gauge out the true intention of North Korea. But since uh, Chairman Kim already sent a letter to President Trump that there will be a, there will be a, a resuming of the negotiation after the, after the military drills, there's a high chance, I believe, that North Korea is going to stop all these provocations once the, uh, the Korea-U.S. joint military drill is over. All right, let's see how things unfold from this point on. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for your insights tonight. Thank you. North Korea was also quick to react to President Moon's Liberation Day speech made yesterday, where he stressed that the momentum for nuclear dialogue is still alive. In a very belligerent tone, even for North Korea, it harshly criticized President Moon, calling him a hypocrite for emphasizing dialogue while continuing on with joint military drills with the U.S. The South Korean government says North Korea's rudeness has crossed the line. Our EG1 has the full story. An official at South Korea's Blue House said Friday that North Korea's statement does not help build ties and that if the North has an issue, it should come to the table for talks, as President Moon Jae-in said in his speech the day before. Speaking to reporters, the official once again explained that Seoul's joint military exercise with Washington is not directed at the North, but is part of preparing for the transfer of wartime operational control. 
The North statement came through its Korean Central News Agency. The Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of the Country wrote on Friday that President Moon talked about dialogue atmosphere in his speech. At the same time, Seoul is holding military exercises with Washington. It called President Moon impudent and said the South should not think it'll be joining talks with the North and the U.S. once the drills are over. The North, it said, has no intention of talking with the South and has nothing to discuss with it anyway. South Korea's unification ministry went a little further, saying the statement was disrespectful. Speaking to reporters Friday, an official expressed great regret that Pyongyang had criticized Seoul in that way, especially a day after Korea's most joyful occasion, Liberation Day. Such comments, he said, are not in line with the spirit of the Panmunjom and Pyongyang declarations, and that for the two Koreas to keep working for a peaceful peninsula, there needs to be a degree of mutual respect. As for the North rejecting any talks with the South, the official said Seoul will not be swayed, but will keep working steadily based on their declarations and agreements. He said the North's comments were too rude to be seen as an official point of view and that South Korea will not be responding directly. But a North Korea expert says the message was actually intended for the U.S. With the working level talks with the U.S. coming up, this is a leverage for the North to get security assurances. The U.S. had promised the North back at the Singapore summit that it would stop the joint military exercises, and the drills are also one of the North's main security concerns. By complaining about them repeatedly, the North is asking for a complete security guarantee in exchange for its complete denuclearization. Through its harsh rhetoric, the expert said the North is criticizing the U.S. as well. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Rival parties once again condemned North Korea for today's missile launches. The ruling party called for North Korea to act with caution and to come back to talks. The opposition blamed the situation on the Moon administration's policies toward the North. Our Kim mo reports. Though rival parties in one voice condemned North Korea's firing of two missiles on Friday, the ruling and opposition parties once again were divided on how South Korea should respond to the situation. The ruling Democratic Party says that the North should stop with its military provocations and return to the negotiating table, expressing concerns that such actions run counter to past combined efforts to bring peace to the Korean peninsula. I don't think the North's latest launches will be helpful to Pyongyang and Washington's upcoming working-level denuclearization talks. Stressing that improving inter-Korean ties need to be done by both sides, the ruling bloc claimed that North Korea should cooperate with open-mindedness. Meanwhile, the main opposition Liberty Korea Party slammed the Blue House ruling bloc and the government for sitting still despite the North's repeated military activities. The party questions Hall's submissive attitude and pointed at the government for failing when it comes to both the economy and national security. What's important at this point is not dialogue but security. The lives of the citizens are more important than just words. The centrist Paren Mide party also criticized the Moon Jae-in administration's North Korea policies, stressing that the government's dialogue-first policy led to Pyongyang's ungrateful actions, such as excluding Seoul from its negotiations with Washington. The government should answer whether North Korea's missile launches and refusal to talk with South Korea are part of its peace-building process. Other minor liberal parties, such as the Party for Democracy and Peace and the Justice Party, also expressed regret over North Korea's provocative actions. The two parties claim that such actions will not be good for both Koreas, and they urge the North to return to dialogue for peace. Kim mo Gyan, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says Japan will continue to coordinate closely with the United States on North Korea's missile launches, again failing to mention South Korea. Abe told reporters earlier today that his government will work with Washington to ensure the safety of the Japanese people. He said this while confirming the missiles launched by the North today do not affect Japan's security. Abe has left out South Korea before when mentioning security cooperation with the United States. A group of North Korean military officials are in Beijing, apparently discussing closer military ties with their Chinese counterparts. The delegation, led by Kim Soo-gil, director of the General Political Bureau of the North 
North Korean People's Army was seen arriving at the Beijing airport. Japanese news outlets report that the two sides are expected to discuss strengthening their military cooperation as well as the recent developments on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang kyung hwa will be again meeting with her Japanese counterpart next week in Beijing on the sidelines of the 9th Seoul-Beijing-Tokyo Foreign Affairs Minister's Talks. The Foreign Ministry announced the schedule earlier today, but it did not confirm any Seoul-Tokyo bilateral talks, simply saying those are still in the works. This comes as South Korea and Japan are trying to lower their tones on the current dispute over trade stemming from Tokyo's export restrictions against Seoul. The ministerial event is slated to take place for three days starting Tuesday, but the three-way talks are expected to be held on Wednesday morning. The meeting first started in 2007 to boost trilateral cooperation, but it had not been held since 2016 due to scheduling reasons. President Moon Jae-in's Liberation Day speech seems to have received a somewhat positive reaction from Japan. Japan's Yomiuri Shimbun wrote today that Tokyo reportedly welcomed the speech. It quoted Japan's Defense Minister Takeshi Iwaya as saying Moon's speech struck a significantly, quote, moderate tone compared to other recent remarks. Iwaya added that the defense cooperation between South Korea and Japan and the trilateral alliance with the U.S. are facing a critical time. He promised Tokyo's cooperation with Seoul on key matters, adding it's desirable for both sides to extend the military information sharing pact known as JASOMIA. But when it came to historical issues, there was not much change. The paper quoted a senior Japanese official as saying that Tokyo hopes Seoul would correct its, quote, violation of international law over the wartime forced labor issue. South Korea is tightening safety inspections on imports of waste products from Japan amid increased public concern over radiation. These are products that Korea buys to recycle. Korea has already introduced tougher inspections of imports of Japanese coal ash. Kan young hoo with the details. South Korea's Ministry of Environment is toughening its inspections of waste imported from Japan with a focus on batteries, tires and plastic. The Environment Ministry said Friday that it plans to do more frequent verification of the reports submitted by local firms on the radiation and heavy metals contained in such waste. Instead of once a quarter, it will happen once a month. The ministry said its on-site inspections of local waste importers will also be carried out more than once a month as well, instead of once a quarter. If heavy metals or radioactive contamination are found to be above the allowed limits, the waste products will have to be sent back to the companies in Japan they were bought from. Announcing the plan, the Environment Ministry said that the decision was based on the recent increase in public concern about imported waste being contaminated with radiation. The stronger inspections are in place to ensure the safety and health of the Korean people and to protect the environment. So we are saying that these new measures are not about counteracting trade disputes or export curves related to a specific country. It was about a week ago that South Korea announced plans to strengthen inspections of Japanese coal ash. In 2018, South Korea imported some 140,000 tons of waste, batteries, tires and plastics from Japan, about 16 percent of its total imports of those three products. These are imported to South Korea from several other countries too, including the U.S., to be recycled. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. A petition in Japan has garnered thousands of signatures calling for a major art festival in Nagoya to bring back a statue symbolizing victims of Japan's sexual slavery. Artists are also demanding for their work at the Aichi Triennale to be taken down in protest of the statue's removal. Imin's Hunt reports. After one of Japan's largest art festivals removed a statue representing victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery, known as Comfort Women, a group of Japanese intellectuals held a campaign urging the organizers to retract their decision. The Comfort Women statue was on display as part of the After Freedom of Expression section at the Aichi Triennale Festival. From August 6 to 15, honorary professors and lawyers in Japan collected over 6,600 signatures on the street and online. These signatures were delivered to the local government, along with a statement arguing that the art festival's decision reflects a lack of freedom of expression.
Also, 11 of the participating artists at the IT Triennale have asked for their artwork to be removed as long as the display of the statue is banned as a public gesture of solidarity with the censored artist. A group of artists sent an open letter condemning the decision to remove the statue and criticizing festival organizers for surrendering to irrational threats and political demands that violate freedom of expression. The artists withdrawing their work include two Korean artists and nine artists from Europe and Central and South America. Some of their works were the main pieces that were used on the festival's poster and for the opening ceremony. Meanwhile, a Spanish art collector has decided to buy the very statue that was censored by the festival. The collector will display the statue along with other art pieces that have been censored or suppressed at an art center he will create next year called Freedom Museum in Barcelona. A group of art and cultural figures in Korea, including the artists of the statue, will hold a discussion on August 22nd in Seoul to take a closer look at the issue from multiple angles. Im in Sun, Arirang News. South Korea's finance ministry has described Korea's economy as stagnant for the fifth straight month. It also said the country's growth and exports are weak and the trade curbs by Japan haven't helped. The gloomy assessment came in the ministry's monthly Green Book released earlier today. Our Yoon Jung Min has the details. South Korea's industrial production has slowly increased, but exports and investments have remained sluggish for a month. The finance ministry has described the economy as stagnant for the past five months in a row. That's mostly because of low growth in the global manufacturing sector, the sluggish semiconductor market, and growing concerns over the U.S.-China trade conflict. The ministry also said Japan's recent export curves on South Korea have also increased economic uncertainties. Mining and manufacturing output grew 0.2% in June from the previous year, while facility investments were up 0.4%. Exports in July fell 11% on-year, affected by sluggish demand for chips and the escalating trade spat between Washington and Beijing. Outbound shipments have fallen for a straight month since last December. As for private consumption, sales of cars were down nearly 4% on-year, and sales at department stores and discount shops also declined. However, online sales and card spending increased nearly 2% and 4% each. Visitors from China jumped nearly 27% in July compared to the year before. Consumer prices edged up 0.6% from a year earlier, as prices of agricultural products and oil remained stable. The ministry said it will fully prepare against Japan's export restrictions and speed of the use of the supplementary budget while doing what it can to boost the overall local economy. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. With media trends shifting from the traditional media to a more personalized experience where anyone can create their own content, the city of Incheon is hosting an event to help support potential new digital content creators. Our Won Jung-hwan takes us there. Digital media content creators and fans gathered in Incheon Songdo Convencia on Friday for the second edition of the Incheon International Single Media Festival. From beauty to gaming and cooking, a wide range of digital content was being showcased. Several high-profile social media influencers, including Po Gyeom, Isabe, and Chinese online influencers, the so-called Wang Hong, took to the stage to show people how to create their own top-quality content. The festival aims to support potential content creators by providing information about everything they might need. And a TV host from Hong Kong who came all the way to Incheon to learn how to become a digital content creator says she has already come up with her own concept. Um, so one of the topics I'd like to do is a dating challenge. So let's say I hack into my friend's phone and use their dating app and I pick a blind date for them. And uh, my friend would do, you know, vice versa. I think it's sort of an interesting prank challenge that, you know, it's casual, it's... At the event, visitors can interact with various content creators and also see the latest in portable equipment that can help them make high-quality content. Arirang TV was at the festival to showcase how media technology has significantly changed by presenting a live TV home shopping show that is filmed just using mobile phones. And a TV host who tried using a phone 
to make content for the first time was dazzled by the new technology. The quality of filming with mobile phone is outstanding these days. I do not feel the need to purchase a separate camera. It was nice to see that I can get feedback straight away and also I can take photos whenever I want. At the two-day event, visitors can personally see the boom in digital-based media. And the organizers hope that this annual event will keep growing further in the future so that they can provide better opportunities for potential creators to launch their own content. Won Jong-an, Arirang News. In the past couple of decades, the number of pet owners in Korea has been rising. Owning a pet, of course, usually costs some money. In this report, our Hong Yu looks at how much that might be and how the pet care market is changing. More than 10 million people living in South Korea have a pet. That's one pet for every four households. According to a pet report by KB Financial Group, raising a dog costs an average of 85 U.S. dollars a month, and raising a cat requires an average of 64 dollars a month. Most of that money goes in food and treats. The rest of the money is used for medical care and grooming. But people are happy to treat their pets because these days, pet owners think of their pets as a member of their family. In Korea, these people are called pet fam. The pet food market alone has seen an average of 19 percent annual growth on the back of this trend. And because people think of their pets as part of their family, they want to take their pets along with them on trips. So tour companies have started creating pet tours. Because there are people who want this kind of tour, we saw a potential of such product in the market and so we came up with our Jeju pet tour. Pets can accompany their family all the time during the tour to Jeju Island, including at the restaurant, tour spots and the hotel because this tour is pet-centered. There are even home spa products for pets such as skin moisturizers, scaling products and grooming mist, labeled as premium products because they're organic, eco-friendly and pet-friendly. They can cost up to $40. Before, people used to think about pets as a living thing that you can buy just like a toy. But because people think of their pets as a part of the family, the pet market has become similar to the baby market. So now owners are turning to premium products for their pets. And there are also luxury pet shops which sell premium products that can cost up to $1,000. That is the cost of a pet bed made out of oak in the style of the bed of King Louis XVI. And at these luxury department store, the most popular dog food costs more than $50 for just one and a half kilograms. These changing consumer trends in the pet market show how owners are willing to spend a lot on the best quality products for their pets now that their sin is part of the family. Hong Yu, Arirang News. Sales of Japanese cars in Korea plummeted last month as the nationwide boycott of Japanese goods continues. They dropped by 32 percent on month to less than 2,700 units. The figure is also down more than 17 percent from the same month last year. Meanwhile, Korea's car production rose more than 17 percent on year in July. Korean auto exports were also up by more than 11.5 percent, the biggest increase since the turn of the year. The rise is largely attributed to booming sales of eco-friendly vehicles and SUVs in North America and Europe. Samsung is testing 5G technology in its chip-making factory in Austin, Texas, to see how it can improve production. The Wall Street Journal reports that the firm has teamed up with American telecoms giant AT&T to replace the factory's existing 4G technology with a customized 5G network to speed up manufacturing. The upgrade will also improve safety as it allows the factory to install more sensors that track air quality and levels of toxic chemicals. The Korean health authorities say 10 people have died so far from this year's heat waves. Also, Korea CDC says from late May to mid-August, almost 1,700 people were hospitalized with heat-related illnesses such as heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Gyeonggi-do province topped the number of patients at around 300, followed by provinces in the south of the country. Around 80 percent of those illnesses occurred at outdoor workplaces or farms. People are being advised to stay indoors and drink plenty of water during hot weather. Korea's domestic football league says it's filing a lawsuit next week against the organiser of last month's match between the K-League All-Stars and Italian football club Juventus. 
The K-League said the litigation against marketing firm The Fester was due to its failure to pay a penalty for breaching the match contract. The contract reportedly stipulated that Juventus star Cristiano Ronaldo was to play at least 45 minutes of the exhibition match. But fans were angered when he sat out the entire match, citing muscle fatigue. The game was also delayed by an hour because Juventus were late. That has been your three-minute news flash. There's finally some relief from the extreme heat wave here in the capital. However, it's still sweltering hot in the southern provinces. Let's get more on the weather from our trusted Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. Good evening, guys. Now, the nation has been a relief from the heat waves, but as soon as the typhoon Carosa dissipated over the East Sea, temperatures in the South and East Coast regions soared back up into the mid 30s, and those regions were placed under heat wave advisories. Now, this weather is expected to continue into our weekend, with daytime highs not rising as high as 30 degrees for most parts. But you may see between 5 to 20 millimeters of showers tomorrow. The rain will start over the central region and move down south by the afternoon. So plan your weekend accordingly. The nation will be free from the tropical nights as Hor begins Saturday at 23 degrees Celsius, while Busan and Jeju are higher at 24 and 25 degrees, respectively. And to the afternoon, so will top 30 degrees, while Daegu and Gyeongju are scorching hot to 34 degrees Celsius. Next week, mostly sunny, sweltering summer weather is expected as the nation will be influenced by the area of high pressure front. However, we will see fewer heat waves throughout the rest of our summer. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will wrap it up for this edition of Adirang News. Thank you, as always, for watching. News in Depth is next.